Philosophers. Philosophers. Well, today's topic is discussing experts. And so, uh, to be fair, there have been other uh, sources that have covered this. David and I have come across separately. They're different sources, by the way. You, uh, where'd you say you heard this discussion kind of talked about first? Uh, I think that I heard it recently, just this past uh, Wednesday. Um, the uh, the local public radio station hosts a publication called Philosophy Talk, which is originally published by WNYC Studios. Interesting. Out of New York City, as it would imply. Oh, of course. What else could NYC possibly stand for? All right. And uh, as my mind races to figure out what else NYC could stand for, um, I heard a, that, well, there are several YouTube channels that I like to watch frequently that discuss both philosophical topics and just honestly things about reality i guess just to put it very broadly because a lot of them are very broad um but two of them talked about um how the role of an expert is changing or how the perception the public perception of experts is changing and so um i think it i think it'd be our turn to kind of talk about it a little bit what we think but doing due diligence um you know to talk about what we're talking about According to the Oxford, an expert is a person who is very knowledgeable about or skillful in a particular area. Uh, the examples given are uh, an expert in healthcare and a financial expert. Um, and then the adjective form is having or involving a great deal of knowledge or skill in a particular area. So very, very straightforward. Um, if you have a lot of skill or expertise in an area you can be considered an expert um so let's talk about that i i think from the definition we can assume that to be an expert in something that i think that might be in and of itself an observation like for example do you think that someone can self-declare themselves an expert in a field Or do you think, uh, even even earlier question, I think that should be answered first is, is being an expert something that is object that can be objectively proven, or is it something that is subjective? I, hmm, your opinion. This is not some. Well, is it your opinion or is it not? <laughs> um. Well, I think there's a um. I think it's a little bit gray because, at some level, declaring yourself to be an expert feels a little bit like giving yourself a nickname like okay but but who's going to go along with it but but also you know like consider a hypothetical where you um are you're a scientist or an engineer or something and you you in you, you create a topic of some sort um as part of your research or your work if you created this thing like like if you like you know let's say that you're uh, back in the the 30s or 40s, and you you engineer, you design and engineer the first computer. Are you not then obviously a computer expert, right? Because you you have come up with whatever there is to know about this thing, and so, you know, someone else could of course question whether you're an expert. But this is you know it, it seems it seems almost um, just as a given that you're an expert, and and so then you can perhaps somewhat redundantly call yourself an expert. I'm beginning to think that how a person could be defined as an expert is dependent on the subject matter. For example, that is a more hard science example in a lot of ways. Um, but take, for example, a an author who writes, like let's take J.R.R. Tolkien, for example, who built the world in which he sets the story that he also wrote. He is the foremost authority on the world and the story because he created both of them. He is the expert because he is the creator, you know. Um, now that he has passed away, however, you know, his son has gone on to try to carry on some of the stories, for example. He has been given the title of expert, but there are also people out there who have studied the work to know it on the level of the person who started the thing, right? But, and I think you see these all the time, 
like I don't know about you, but when I'm in a game store and I'm talking about like Magic the Gathering, for example, who has which has a lore set and a world built behind the playing card game. Granted, after the fact, <laughs> um, but uh, <clears throat> one of the ways people will validate your expertise in that is to question you. Like that is very frequent, and it's so much so that like my wife hates it uh, when she uh, likes something and talks about her interest, and someone immediately begins to like go down their list of, okay, well, if you really are an expert, then you would know, you know, what happens to this character on the fourth day of the, you know, and they do really specific examples to see if you can figure, to see if you know something. And that's how they judge for themselves, whether you are an expert or not. Right. And so in that type of expertise, I feel like expert, you being an expert is your ability to essentially just firstly recall the knowledge of the subject ad nauseum. Like you don't really need to look it up. You can just recall it from memory. That's like, I feel like one of the most uh, common ways we can determine whether like someone's if you, like an expert. Like if you're an expert car mechanic, then I should be able to ask you and receive almost immediately a satisfactory answer of how do I change the oil in my car? Exactly. And... He shouldn't have to look it up. <laughs> like if you went to a mechanic and you're like, hey, I think this is going wrong. And you see him pull out his phone and starts Googling the problem. You assume he's not an expert, right? Right. Um, however, I think scientifically, then this is something we kind of discussed a minute ago. Because of how, because of what science is. And we've talked about it before. Science is not, it, it's a, science is a system by which people pursue the truth right or discover new things or explain things and it's done so by asking questions in a way that any person theoretically should be able to duplicate and by duplicating and proving proving through duplication of the same process and getting consistent outcomes you can discover essentially causal relationships that exist in reality just to, just to broadly lop them all together like for example, well, so, sort of. I'm I'm getting hung up on. Sure, on, sure. No, correct me if I'm if I'm maybe speaking out of turn on something there. I'm getting hung up on the word proving. Okay, um, demonstrating. How about that? I I guess so. Like you know, one of the one of the primary distinguishing attributes of science is that nothing. Like, there is no concept of proof in right. science, and it, so because you you always have to accept that it's falsifiable. Right, it's always falsifiable. It's I guess demonstrating. In fact, if you if you say that you have proven something that's not falsifiable, then it's immediately tossed out. It's not science. Well, to take it back to your second grade science lesson, it's you can say something about the world as an you can essentially assert that's what your hypothesis is. Is you assert this will happen if I do this, and yeah. then you demonstrate it, and then the consistency of the consistency of your demonstration to produce the same outcome, not just by yourself, but especially by others leads to us being able to rely on that assertion in lieu of knowing whether or not it's absolutely true. It's just gaining a high enough degree in confidence right. to or do more succinctly, your ability to predict yes. has a direct or, or we, we presume to correlate with understanding. Right. But the key thing about your ability to predict is it needs to be a system that someone else can use to arrive at the same prediction. Right, you know, if you come out of your basement and say, guys, I predicted this and it happened. Yeah, okay, but that's just hearsay. Right, well, and for example, otherwise psychics, for example, if they just so happen to have a satisfactory enough rate of being able to accurately predict outcomes, that is technically science, unless they were, but it's not because they're unable to show how it works and impart that knowledge to someone else. To then duplicate it, or an easier example to to understand that maybe he doesn't get into the 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 weeds of uh, woo woo and uh, the weeds of woo. Yes, yes. Um, it <coughs> you know suppose you have uh, ten people, each of which are sorry, you have ten people, each of which need to guess the outcome of a coin toss. Right. Or well, it, we don't have to limit it to ten. Uh, we can say we have an unlimited supply of people that have to predict a coin toss. Eventually. By sheer luck, we will have somebody who has predicted a thousand coin tosses correctly in a row. And we'll think, wow, they must be some sort of expert. But actually, no. We all we know that they just got lucky. Right. 
Um, so, but in that type of field, um, to be an expert, I think we need to declare the scope too. To be an expert scientist, for example, just that broadly, your expertise is your ability to facilitate that system and knowledge of the system and your skill in implementing the system of science. And that's something that is, you can objectively, air quotes, you know, prove, uh, is watching that, per- have that person do some science or have that person refer to times they've done science successfully. And if their success rate is higher than average, they could be considered an expert. But generally, we don't talk about expert scientists. Scientists are typically re- looked at as experts in their field. Because, All right, because science is enormous. Yes. Well, science, like I said, is a system. It's Science, if more than anything else, is almost a philosophy, if not. Well, it, well, it is. It, it is, is a philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. And so if... Uh, so generally, like, for example, when we talk about the environment, we talk about environmental science or experts on. And sometimes it goes down to being an expert in just one aspect of the field in which they study. For example, climate change experts. They are environmental scientists most of the time who that's the work they do in environmental science is studying climate change. And because they study it, we ascribe to them the level of expert because they are the ones doing the work and creating the theories on how it is but because of the nature of science we can look at theoretically the again we we disagree that there are whether or not the you can practically do these experiments or whether you should but at least theoretically any other person who isn't an expert can validate their expertise by performing their experiments with their hypothesis and seeing the uh, and being and seeing the uh, accuracy of their predictions so um in that case i'm not sure if that separates the camp of experts into two camps those that can be objectively uh those that can be objectively verified and those that can be subjectively verified i guess the further question is is do you need to be verified or validated in order to actually be an expert verified as in like by another person or yeah others essentially like for example i I would say that pragmatically speaking yes because what good is your expertise if no one considers you an expert um at least in things that require like if your your ability to communicate your uh what you're working on for example like neil degrasse tyson and uh, carl sagan were the two examples of scientific communicators that we give expert status and if they did not have it their ability to communicate science into more simplified terms uh would be irrelevant you know because no one would listen to them anyway um so well yeah expertise is a is a social construct maybe well well yes it is a social construct but um, it's very similar to authority, I guess, that, you know, an expert in isolation isn't really anything. Um, well, mm-hmm. I, I guess, well, in isolation, they could still be an expert, but it's irrelevant. Because what matters about expertise is how seriously people take them. Exactly. You can be an expert in a field in isolation, but why does it matter that you're an expert if you're in isolation? Like the whole point of the concept of expertise existing, and I agree that it goes along with authority, and so much so in fact that we even call people that, you know, oh, this is so-and-so. He is the authority on climate change. Yeah. Well, and it's why when someone cites an expert in defense of a proposition, we declare that as an argument from authority. Right. And reject it. Exactly. So, I guess, I don't know what that says, though, about whether or not a person could be objectively, whether or not a person's expertise can be objectively validated or subjectively validated. I I would suppose that it can be objectively verified, but it still has to be subjectively accepted because well, like the, the thing the thing is that we would have to pin down strict criteria and agree on them then we could 
then we could see if they're an expert because because right now the ex, the, the definition we have right now is essentially are they good at it? Okay, well, how good is good? Right, and what is good? Like, you know, how would you know if you're not the expert? You know, and that's and, and ultimately, it, it is. It does come down to the in, the choice of every individual who observes or listens to the expert to, on whether or not they can they would even accept what is being spoken about, um, just based on the fact that that person is the expert for example, like, and that's an argument I get all the time from people who, I won't call them climate change deniers, but people who call into question the seriousness of climate change, for example. Um, It does not matter to them whether you are an expert in the field or not, because they disagree with the underlying premise altogether. And so, but when, but the way they treat experts and your layman differently is, you know, if the expert approaches them to talk about it, instead of attacking the point, they actually attack the expert status and they question the authority of the individual instead, you know. And so in that way, being an expert is almost counterproductive because now you're not even going, they're not even going to listen you're to what you're just part to of the system, man. Right. And so they're going to call in to question your expertise and just disregard your point entirely, which is fallacious as well. You know, when we're, anytime you get into discourse or discuss anything with anyone, an expert is useful for communicating the idea as it is, but at what point do you just rely on those people and trust them? Because you do have to at some point. Because I mean, like, do they, you though? Well, okay. So suppose we're um, we're taking into consideration the the conclusions of a climate scientist will stay with this paradigm um you are a, uh, a cynic and so you you ask this scientist uh you know um or well you you assert the uh the climate is not changing and so then the scientist says well yes it is and you say well how do you know he says well i have these data okay but where'd you get those you know um where'd you get them data where'd you get them data uh and and so he's like well i got them from here well how, you know how do we know those, you know, you see, we go into infinite regress here. And, and basically it just comes down to, I don't trust a word you have to say. Right. And, um, yeah, I think for a, a little bit, I'd like to talk about how the role of the expert has existed in society in the past, because I do think that we can glean some knowledge from it. Um, uh, I'll be sure to link where I got my information from just so you can check it out for yourself. But essentially, it, there is a pragmatic reality that most people, I think, would agree to that diversification of knowledge and skill sets or decentralization of knowledge and skill sets is beneficial to societies. Societies can achieve greater things when people can afford to specialize. That's a common belief, and I don't know of anyone who disagrees. You know, if if every person had to do every job, like each person had to put food in their their own mouths and clean themselves and everything. And when I say put food in their mouths, I mean go all the way down to like farm their own food or hunt their own food. It's really hard for one of those people, you know, and everyone also has to be their own doctor, for example. Well, ancient... But you're busy spending all your time farming and hunting. Right. You have no time to become an expert doctor. Right. But, but even then, it, that's... But even then you're your own doctor too, you know, uh, human civilizations figured out a long time ago, it makes a lot more sense if, okay, it's more efficient if you who are better at hunting than everyone else just hunts for everybody. And you can then take the food that you've gathered from and trade it for something and else. trade it for my ability to be a doctor. So anytime you get sick, I can help you. But, and so that's why you need to feed me. And a not super far back in the past example of this was uh, how teachers were treated in the United States back in the 1800s. Most teachers weren't paid in money. They were supported by their community because their job did not yield anything that benefited directly the teacher. So if you were a teacher in a small township out in the middle of nowhere, the people of the community would donate food to you oftentimes donate you a place to stay and would help you because of the service you gave back to the group because they couldn't afford to pay you so 
how about we take away the other stresses of life you may have to face instead since you're educating our children, for example. Um, and and that's, that is what allows jobs like the teacher to exist. And it's from that concept you get people who are considered experts. Um, you go to those people when you want to do something that they're doing because they do it more than you and you assume they know more about it than you do. That's why we have the, um, you know, this is technically by, by strict definitions, not the case, but why we, um, throw around the word professional as if it is equivalent to expert, uh, right. because, because, you know, technically professional just means you get paid to do the thing. Right. Uh, professional as opposed to amateur. And of course we, you know, we throw around the word amateur as if it means, Bad. <laughs> well, or mediocre anyway. Yeah, novice or something like that. Right. Um, but amateur just means that it basically, well, not necessarily volunteer because you might not be doing it for somebody else, but you're you're doing it for free, right. whatever it is you're doing. Um, but what we associate a professional with an expert because, hey, you're getting paid to do this. You must know what you're doing. Right. It, it's an acknowledgement that someone else trusts you enough to pay you to do the thing. Um, for example, we are technically professional podcasters, hosts, because we are paid to do this. Granted, how much is irrelevant, <laughs> but technically, but technically, we are professionals. But it's up for debate whether we're any good at it, so A or experts, exactly. <laughs> but we can say that we are not amateurs. So, um, but we were at one point, but we are not anymore. So, and if you would like to help us continue to be professionals, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so the the reason this is even being discussed today is in more recent times, this has always existed as a philosophical concept, but in more recent times, it's becoming more prevalent. It's the willingness of people to challenge people who are considered the experts and challenge the notion that an expert can exist altogether. And I'm going to poke fun at flat earthers for this because that they exist as a group of these people. They reject the notion that that expert can exist in the first place on the premise that if they can't understand it themselves or if they can't observe it, demonstrate it themselves, why should they believe you and they should only trust their senses, for example. Um, Basically an argument for personal incredulity. Exactly. And so, from my observation, the world is flat. And I trust my own observations more than anyone else. And so, and, and that's the root thing, is that I do not trust anybody. Don't look round to me. Don't look round to me, boy. But it is a circle, though. How do you know that? Uh, because of flat, flat circles. Um, but... Uh, but anyway, but that notion is becoming more and more common. And uh, one of the sources I looked at for this uh, comes from a YouTube channel called Wisecrack that does really good stuff. Um, they talk about uh, flat earthers, but they talk about many other groups as well. Um, and about this notion that you can't trust anybody else. And it's that, uh, and they're really speaking to the fiber of a society. Like trust is a fundamental part of the fi fabric that makes up a society. And you, the listener, and us here, we demonstrate it every day, whether we realize it or not. Anytime you get out on the road, ooh, um, and uh, roads, uh, you start driving around, and you come to a stop sign. You trust that everyone else will follow the rules at the stop sign. And mm. that's what allows the system to go. You, you do to a degree. Or you trust that people aren't just going to drive straight to their destination like, and when I say straight, I mean a literal straight line through other things to get to their destination. Um, and so that trust is what allows us to work in unison without communicating. It's, it takes advantage of the, what makes us sentient, you know, our ability or what I would say makes us sentient is our ability to put, project ourselves onto another uh, entity and assume they would think the same way to a, on a very basic level. Right. Like the thing is, like I, you know, when I come up to an intersection, you know, a four way stop, I don't necessarily trust the other drivers to stop. And often I will wait and make sure that they do before I decide to go. Right. But the, the, the assumption that I have is, is I, I trust that they like me would like to get to their destination without being involved in a collision. Exactly. And uh, a better example I think would be is at a, uh, two-way stop or 
yeah, where if you're at a T in an intersection, only the road parallel to yourself has to stop. You do not have to stop. You have the right of way and you don't have a stop sign. Do you stop at all of those? Now, you might slow down based on how based on how trusting you are uh, in society. If someone's kind of inching their way into the lane. Right. But if it's like on a city block where you cannot see until you are at the intersection, right? You can judge, I think, how well a person has faith or trust in their societal group if they just plow right on through knowing they don't have to stop because they're just going to trust that other people, like I would stop there, and because I would stop there and I trust these people, I project onto them that they will stop too, and that is something I can consider to be a truth or assume well enough to be a truth and have you know, trust it. It really is having faith in it because you have no reason to believe that besides your own experiences, but you assume it. And that's what allows you to get to your destination in 20 minutes instead of an hour. Because otherwise, if you had absolutely zero faith, you would come to a stop at every intersection, regardless of whether you had the right or way or not. You know, that, that's the spectrum I'm trying to lay out. And so your trustingness uh, or trustworthiness of society is can be measured in how much you slow down or come to a stop at an intersection at which you do not have to, but the people uh, congruent to you do. So, anyway. You mean perpendicular. perpendicular. Yep. Well, you know, it takes a line perpendicular. Congruent means they come to a 90 degree intersection, right? No, that's perpendicular. Oh, congruent is, yeah. Congruent means identical. Yeah, you're right. Polar congruency, anyway. Uh, <laughs> you will. You will. Um, but anyways, the, the, the thing that's being discussed though, is, uh, how that trust meter, the average of that trust meter across societies has going down. And because it's going down, you end up with people that are more likely to end up in these flatter societies. Another uh, example given was looking at the kinds of conspiracy theories that exist as well. The, uh, an old conspiracy theory, for example, being the JFK assassination, what really happened? Those conspiracy theories are thought out in a way that are tempting because they have internal logical consistency, even if there's no proof, right? But when you look at something like the Flat Earth Society, they don't even have internal logical consistency, but people are still flocking to that way of thinking. And so why is that? And the answer often given is, these people have a lower trust in society and more specifically the expert because the experts have often been the people in which society puts their trust in order to make their lives easier. And there is a good motivation for us that we benefit from putting our trust in other people that we consider experts because you can offload your thoughts onto that person. You can let that person do the thinking for you and just tell you the outcome. Uh, another good example is the in the media, you know, pundits by definition are supposed to be political experts. And they're the people who are supposed to give you the skinny on who to vote for and who not to vote for based on very bullet pointed, quick to digest reasons. Like, okay, you don't need to read this person's political platform. In a nutshell, they're pro this, anti this, pro this, anti this, pro this. If that sounds like you, you should vote for them. If that doesn't, you shouldn't vote for them. And that's the end of it. Instead of you having to read through their long uh, policy proposals and things like that. You know, and so what happens when we reach a society where you can no longer trust those people? Or should you have ever trusted those people? You know, what do we lose from that trust? Is it good or is it bad? And I think those are all valid questions that we can be called into consideration. I think so. And, um, well, and the, I think the, the degree to which you should uh, trust someone, uh, trust an expert, is uh, ha has to do with the, the nature of the field in which they're an expert as well. Like, you know, if... If someone, if we're talking about, say, a scientist in a highly relevant field like physics, um, you know, my my willingness to trust them uh, is, you know, directly it directly corresponds to the types of technology that can be developed with their theories, um, you know. 
because if I if I, you know if a new technology comes out as a result of some paper that they published, I have a pretty good reason to trust them because I can see it in action. Potentially, I could own the thing that that puts it in action, um, and so so then I, I have a good reason to trust them. But you know, as far as like a, a political pundit, I basically it's basically just hearsay. I just have to take their word for it. Right. I think another thing to uh, another institution that well, let's look at the institutions from which we have generally like, created our experts, and by that I mean higher education, for example. Um, which would you trust a scientist who got their doctorate from MIT more from a professor from a scientist who got their doctorate at a community college if they could do that? Well, they can't, but but just for example, but a, a very small school, a very small, never heard of, it's not acclaimed or accredited in any way school. Like, would, would you trust them differently, knowing just that about them? Yeah, it, it depends on the field and their work. Physics, I, yeah, oh, physics, applied physics. They're both. Let's say they're both studying uh, graphene and and, and other uh, laminar objects, uh, laminar materials like that. Okay. Um, I don't know, but I, like my my willingness to trust them then basically has to do with their work. I'm like, okay, okay, well, let's, say something and we'll test it. Well, let's say they're okay. Yeah, but let's say they're working on the same thing and. One of them comes, the guy from MIT comes to the conclusion that these can be used to create insanely strong fabrics or whatever, you know, which may have a good use for you and would generate technologies that would be useful. Um, And the other one calls him into question and says, no, it's wrong. And without knowing what the reasons are for one saying it would work and the other saying it wouldn't work, could you trust them differently? No, I think at this point, I trust neither of them and call the engineer and say, try to make it work. There you go. Right. But the thing is, in the we, it, the society is different from that. You know, most people will trust the person from MIT more because that school has a reputation for creating things and bringing them into reality. I, I, think, I think where that becomes relevant is uh, for, well, this isn't necessarily true at a, well, okay, it is. Because in order to get your PhD, you have to do some sort of work, uh, especially if we're talking about science. Um, you have to do some sort of research. So so there is you do have something to show for it. Um, but it, it may not be, you know, particularly interesting. Like, you know, in, in uh, mathematics, you just need to basically prove a really hard theorem. And then voila, you have a PhD. Yeah. Um, you know, because you've technically done something that no one's ever done before. Um, and they love saying that. Right. Um and so, so I guess if they haven't done anything particularly meaningful in pursuit of their degree, then the which, which school they got it from might determine, say, willingness to hire or bring on to some research team. Right. Um, but that's about the only time that that becomes relevant. Well, and to up the ante on our example, say both of these scientists have proven things in the past and led to the development of other technologies in the same field, but now they've created a new, lighter, faster, better version of the same thing. Like they've both been going back and forth, one upping each other, and now and in the past they both agreed that okay, yeah, he one up me, so now I gotta go back to the lab and make something better. And then this person comes out with one that's five percent stronger or whatever, has a five percent stronger. Or maybe we can strength. take a classic example, Tesla versus Edison. Exactly. Um of which I don't know if either of them had degrees. No, this uh, is I think they, before that. Well, they do like, know they like was electrical engineering a concept really? No, probably not. No, it well, you know, it was a, it was a new field. It was being invented at the time, literally. So, um, yeah, so we we could have something like that, and then at that point, it's just you know, take your pick, um, right? But but at that point, both of them had demonstrated that they knew what they were doing, um, and so it it's um, it doesn't really matter what their credentials are. On paper, they've proven themselves. Right. And so, at that point, those credentials no longer matter. So, but the thing I would say... Well, that, they, well they, they've made their own credentials for themselves, and it doesn't matter what school they went to, if any. Right. However, that's not what gets brought up, though. When like, I'm just going to give an example. Whenever a scientist is brought onto like, a TV show to talk about science... And he talks about how he graduated from MIT. Exactly. They, they very rarely talk about 
exactly what they've done. They'll say, oh, they've worked on robotics at MIT. It's like, okay, but what robot? It doesn't matter. He's a robotics expert from MIT. You should trust him. It's like, and don't be wrong. I, I know. programmed Arduinos once. And <laughs> right. You know, and that doesn't make me an expert. But um, in the past, when it was unacceptable to ask the average person to be able to understand the concept and they were incapable or unwilling to understand the concept, at some point they either have to, I think there's a, a nexus of choices here. You know, there's, there is... I don't trust either. I trust one or the other, or I trust them both, and I don't care. You know, like, there's there's a range of it how engaged people are, but ultimately, decisions will get made, and you not participating will not change the outcome. You give it to... You then are putting your trust in society as a whole to act on your behalf. Um, and I think that the role of the expert is important, because of the reasons I gave earlier, like it, we need experts to do thing to do the hard things that we don't have the time or the interest to do that will benefit us, right? Um, but the work of those experts only matters pragmatically if we trust those experts. Because if you're not a widely accepted, trusted expert in a field, or your expertise is so called into question that most people would not even consider you an expert, for example in the society in which we exist now, you're not getting funding for your project, you know, or people will not go on crowdfunding websites and fund your project, you know. And so in a way, we already can see how societies support who they consider to be an expert in a very narrow field, even down to a single product, by where they're willing to put their money. You know, and that's much different than the way things used to be, where you had one or a very small handful of people who had the resources to fund these advancements. And it was up to them to decide who the expert was. And that's why expertise kind of the concept of the expert matters and why whether or not you accept that person as an expert matters. And a good example, I guess, going back to your uh, bringing up Nikola Tesla and uh, Edison um, Tesla was not regarded so much as an expert in his time because he wasn't as good as marketing himself as Edison was. Edison won more contracts because Edison, regardless of whether or not Edison was actually more of an expert, some now a lot of people nowadays would argue that he wasn't. It didn't matter. He was a better businessman. He was a better businessman, and he was better at appearing as an expert. You know, and that's another thing too is you can become a charlatan who is treated as an expert just because you're able to convince people that you are. And I think that's why people, uh, that's one of the examples given by people to not trust people called experts because they could be charlatans, you know, which granted that's always a potential problem you have to look out for. Um, and so that's why we, you know, we want to look at how can we prove it? You know, can we, or can we increase our, ability to predict whether someone is an expert in fact or not you know um and when we call these charlatans into question they ruin the they they damage the integrity of all other experts because they damage the concept itself of the expert you know and that is in turn damaging to societies or civilizations which will which exist the way they do because we have trusted experts in the past um, now, whether this is good or whether this is bad is still open into interpretation, you know. Um, thoughts on that? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, hmm. I guess now... Have we... Have we said what there is to say about, you know, what level of, of trust should be given to so-called experts? No, we haven't really talked about it beyond the fact that it is subjective. Like, each person will have a different litmus test for what they consider what makes an expert in their eyes. And then, additionally, they have a different... Different people will be varying degrees of trusting of as someone that they see as an expert. You know, I think, for example, 
you have a very high bar for what it determines what determines someone to be an expert but once you are able to determine that person as an is an expert you would put a higher degree of confidence than the average person um would you disagree with that statement for example no not necessarily i mean it's inductive reasoning which can be fallacious you know because basically what you're saying is, well, this person's been right before, so I'm going to trust what they say now. Or you're, But what I guess I'm saying is that you put all of your effort on the front end of validating the expert first. But once they've passed all your validations, it's it's enough validating now. This is pretty much how we approach most anything that involves trust is, you know, you, you the, the hard part is earning trust. And then once it's there, it's, it, you know, it's got its mm, momentum, I guess we could call it. Yeah. It's difficult to get the ball rolling, but once it's going, it's fine. It can go on its own more easily. Right. I do think, but the, but there's a difference that to be noted between people, for example, who might fall into like the flat earth camp. They will come to recognize the expertise of people. What well, They'll call it into question all the way, but even if you get them to accept that this is a person who is an expert, because the position of expert in their mind is is not something to be inherently trusted, they still won't trust the people. And that's where the problem comes from. I think the problem also comes from having a low bar to deciding who is and isn't an expert. And then having a low bar for uh, scrutiny as well. So it's like, oh, well, I'll accept just about anyone who seems like an expert with no evidence. And then once I've accepted them as an expert, I will put my whole faith in them as well. And you see that, I think, on the side of uh, a lot of the social science that's being done today. Um, as long as the person seems to talk on points that you already agree with, you can consider them an expert. And then once you do, you just agree with everything that they have to say. And then you see these rapid evolutions of social theory that have gone on in the past 20 or 30 years, leading in, into philosophies such as intersectionality and things like that if you look at the pattern i think on who the leaders or the experts in the field were they were people who agreed with a movement to start with gained a large degree of trust and then had their own effect on adjusting the trajectory and that's why it changed so fast yeah i I think i think there's something to be said about the fact that um you know that we tend to latch on to the first thing that we hear about a topic um because you, you hear you hear a thing and as long as it seems reasonable to you you'll believe it even even if you you know don't believe it very strongly but then w- once you once you hear something which contradicts it now you're like now cognitive dissonance kicks in yep and you're like hmm and it, it takes a lot more to convince you otherwise exactly um there's also something to be said about the self-defined well not self-defined experts but um eating your own dog food in a way or it's it's, it's the same thing where Because I'm an expert in this field, I can adjust the trajectory of the field, and I can even break logical consistency within the field, but people will trust me anyway, you know, and you see that all the time as well, where these people become experts, and it seems like whoever is the most radical in their estimations gets to maintain their expertise. It's a sense, and not only that, but because these people achieve their expert status by pleasing the populace they will please the populace in any way that they can to maintain that status or to grow in that status. And so this person is no longer an expert because of the subject matter, because they are making legitimate discoveries, but because they are playing lip service, you know, and that's another problem. And you see that in religions as well. uh, A lot is not a lot, but you see that happen in religion as well, where your acclaim as an expert is, held next to god you know like for example the pope is seen as the god's messenger so he gets the word directly from the big man upstairs so you can't question it so they hold a really high he is a considered the expert on god in a lot of ways for catholics for example right there's also an intersection here of, of religion and science um you know take for example and you know this is a this is one reason to to remain skeptical about experts is that you'll have you'll have someone who you know is a is a let's say a christian and in pursuit of a political agenda goes and gets a phd in biology just so that he can come out 
and tell all the Christians that evolution's not true. Right. Look he, at me with my PhD in biology. Um, you know, you should trust me. And then, and then they do because he reaffirms their conclusion. Right. So. Well, and I think to, to pick on something else that's happened, it, since we're talking about stuff like that, is um, looking at these uh, college admission scandals of late where people have been paying large sums of money to get their kids into, air quotes, good schools. Uh, why does that exist? You know, and it's obvious, you know, to, to all of us, or at least to me anyway, because my parents told me you need to go to college and go to a good school so that you will be taken seriously, right? And so because the social notion that, oh, you went to the Ivy League, which because it's the oldest schools, right, um, you went to Harvard. Only You know, no one will question your status as an expert now when it comes to hiring you. You can have your pick of the litter. So what you study and, and whether or not you actually become the expert is irrelevant um, don't get me wrong. There is a motivation at times by those institutions to be sure that they produce produce experts because well, because if they just let anyone get through, eventually they're going to get found out that it doesn't take anything to graduate from Harvard, for and, instance, and it will ruin the the, the prestige. They will lose their image. Yeah. Yes. Um, but for those who, but that's why these college admission scandals exist is because people wanted to essentially buy that prestige for their kids. And um, and I think that points to a fundamental flaw in why we just inherently trust people or why if I got a degree in computer science, but another guy got his degree in computer science from MIT, he will get slaughtered for the job over me just because the words, the letters MIT are on his resume, you know, um, and it might even get to the point where they just don't even test that person in the interview because they just go on the MIT assumption. was test enough. Yeah. 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 That was test enough. All right. You know. And uh, we all can kind of see the problem with that as well. But I think the uh, problem to be overcome here is how we can trust people to be experts or how can we have experts? Because I don't think I don't think that we can reach the conclusion that we don't need experts. I think that experts are necessary for societies to continue to ascend up the comfort ladder you know and the human development index they're they're critical for that but how do but how we make those experts i think needs to be adjusted in order to make sure we are getting actual experts by uh getting actual experts but we can't just do that by redefining the term you know i think another useful thing might be if we were to like narrow the scope of in what fields can somebody be an expert like the the thing that I was contrasting earlier where you know an expert biologist let's say versus uh, an expert you know like a political expert like what does that what does that mean to be a political expert right. you know because you can't really uh you know like to to the point where you could demonstrate your expertise where you're trying to make like political predictions well at that point you're some sort of scientist yeah you're a political scientist at that point right and so so then then it becomes relevant again but like you know trusting somebody on the news and what they have to say okay right well that's a different thing too and i mean it's they're they're the same and they're different because the news for example exists and this is one thing i love about the internet for example i love and it's a love hate thing with the internet I can learn about anything I want, but there is also no bar for what gets put out there. You At least you know the people who are hired to do the news, that's their job. And someone had to have trust in them already, had to have enough trust to put them in front of you. You know, there's, there's something to be said about the popular, uh, the wisdom of the crowd, as some people say. I, I don't buy into that entirely, but... There's something to be said about the fact that other people trust this person as well. Whether it's earned or not, uh, it still will, I think, lend more seriousness to their... Like, for example, if there are a thousand people out there that I'm going to have to, like, figure out which one of these people are experts, which ones do you start with? You know, I think most people would start with the people that are most highly acclaimed already by others because we have a minimum baseline trust in other people. Um, and so I need to go ahead and validate them first you know and we think about this in more mundane settings as well if you're a manager responsible for hiring somebody for your uh, your research team or your production team 
um, you are going to put more trust in the person who has more work experience, especially if they were able to hold a single job for quite a while running because, you know, okay, not only did that other company trust them and hire them, but they kept them around for a while, so they must have known what they were doing. Right. Or if the person had never been fired, like, even if they've had a, a great diversity in their job experience, if each time it was that person's choice and they, for example, got a raise each time, which you can't always prove that, but that clearly shows that this person has been moving up the ladder and other people have been trusting in them and bringing them on. This, of course, brings in other things about loyalty, but that has nothing to do with their expertise. A exactly. And so, right, it, 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 for different reasons, it calls into question their loyalty, but it does, speaks, it can speak just as much to their expertise. However, if you have someone who's been fired, especially if they've been fired more than once, and not just laid off, but like fired. Like the company still exists and is doing fine and was doing fine when this person was let go. Then it's like, okay, well, clearly the, someone else's judgment was used here. And this person determined this per the, this applicant to be of not good enough stature. And so now I'm going to pay a lot more attention to what this person says in their interview and be more uh, and scrutinize them more, you know, whether that's fair or not. That's how people are. So, um, I do want to take if if we have if you don't have anything else to say about it, I want to take the last couple of minutes we have to talk about um because we we do this a lot we are I think we you know like to talk about things through uh, our libertarian lenses from time to time but I would like to talk about how the role of experts in the society would play out perhaps in a true free society and how that works okay okay um so the thing that makes a libertarian society, a libertarian society is the calling into question authority and essentially wanting to move authority down to the individual. Like ultimate authority is held in the hands of the individuals, right? In a nutshell, uh, David nodded yes, so I'm going to keep going with it. Now, most experts today exist due to institutions which have authority or it comes from others like they're given authority from others and determined to be experts by others first and so we trust them because others have well a good libertarian would trust no one and uh, in that way or they would have a certain degree of scrutiny as well so in a free society when it comes to determining experts, is it any different than the way we determine who experts are now, or would it be better or worse, do you think? I don't think that... I think, I think the way by which we evaluate expertise is very psychological, mm -hmm. so I don't think that it would change all that much. Okay. The only reason I bring it into question is because I feel like, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or think that I'm wrong, I feel as though a free society would have a lower degree of the trust factor of the societal fabric than the society in which we currently live. Because one of the basis, that, one of the things that comes from the libertarian school of thought is the questioning of authority. Well, an expert exists because people tacitly accept authority. In a lot of ways, because we we've, we've not been able to determine an objective way, it has to be subjective. The thing the thing is, in, in a free society, the type of authority that is questioned is the the type of authority which wields force. So we we question those who tell us what to do, um, not necessarily like, like well you know we we it should still be a healthy level of of questioning, but um you know. Those who are merely claiming to report facts are not necessarily scrutinized in the same way as those who directly tell us what to do. Right. Because you can you can tell me whatever facts you want, but it's up to me to make as to whether I want to make decisions based on those facts, whether I accept the facts or not. But if you are going to give me orders, now suddenly I have a more direct reason to question you. Right, but I guess you know, just like when when a when a parent tells their their child do this and they don't understand why, and so immediately, well, why do you want me to do that? Right. I think 
where I find it interesting is it's in the, the weeds of pragmatism, to be honest. Because, for example, even in a free society, you are still subject to the forces of others through the power of the freedom of association, for example. Um because we had talked before how one of the greatest tools in a free society for disciplining uh, others is ostracism, you know. So, and influence games are, I think, even more important in free societies because if you can't force people, you have to be able to convince them what to do, which can be just as dangerous. You know, propaganda would work, I think, just as well in a free society as it would in a uh, um, not free society. So experts play their roles in those things. Um, Experts are often cited when propaganda is being generated. Experts are often given the authority to make the decisions by others. So in a free society, those people would be given more clout because we it, it, for example even if like today you can call an expert into question yourself and you can determine whether that person is an expert for yourself or not right but if that expert is being consulted by large entities that are able to make decisions that will affect your life for example by the products that will be created that you get a choice to consume or not if that expert gets a has a large degree of influence in that process, they have a large degree of influence on you um, by their ability to uh, sway. I hate saying the means of production because it sounds like I'm about to go full commie, but still, you know, like they can sway direction. Now, granted, one thing that the free free society would have as a tool to combat this is the ability for individuals to allow the market to decide as well. Well, Right. Like like the thing that came to mind is I, I immediately went back to, uh, Tesla versus Edison, sort of, but a little bit of the aftermath of it. Um, you know, at, at some point, an expert was decided upon, and then based on that, a decision was made, and now the power grid runs on AC power. Exactly. Um, you know, and and that affects all of us. Like, you can't, you can't get a DC power line to your house if you wanted one, or if you knew how to engineer one. Right. Um, you can't do it. But, but then also, there's, the, part of the, the thing with that, well, first of all, there's technical reasons why, um, you know, th- th- there's a reason why someone was called an expert who decided to use AC for, for power delivery because it's good for that. But, um, but, but, even, you know, if you, if there was enough demand for DC in a free society, there wouldn't be a government enforced monopoly on what, you know, company can supply your power and how they're going to do it. Somebody who, decided that there was enough of a market to do it, could say, you know what, I'm going to start a DC power plant on every block and we're, we'll do it that way. Right. Well, and the thing that uh, is interesting about that is you're right. Experts in the current sphere do wield a large degree of influence, I guess, because there is a there is the penultimate authority that will rely on them. And that's one thing that gets talked about a lot as well. You know, a lot of people, for example, when someone's running for president, they're scrutinized under the lens of are they an expert in the subjects in which they're discussing, but also the people they put into those positions of power, the bureaucrats, um, for example, like the cabinet members are all bureaucrats. They are held even, they, they are often held up in even higher scrutiny for their field because it's a lot more specific. You know, why is this person the head of the department of education? If they've never been an educator, for example, um, that's a lot. That's a lot easier to justify. Uh, that's a lot easier of a level of scrutiny to justify. In all reality, a person who's being elected president, it should they shouldn't have to be an expert in education. They should be. In, in all actuality, they only need to pick experts. They they need to be good at delegating to experts and picking experts. Like that really is what we should judge them on. In a lot of ways, is how able they are to lead other people, and that's really what the job is. But it's like never the, like the that ideal way. president would be someone who doesn't necessarily know much about anything, but is able to uh, reliably pick experts and then just weigh the decision as anyone else would. Exactly, and uh, but that's not how they're we treat meant to it. be. They would be meant to be some sort of like neutral party making a decision based on on expert opinion. Yep. Right, but um, back to the free society. 
and we'll take your example of some regions or neighborhoods have DC power stations on every block and there are really short, you know, interconnects. And then there are some regions that have large AC blocks. That's less efficient than if we were all on DC or all on AC, for example. Right, because now we have to make different appliances to run on the different... Yep. Uh, yep. Oh, I'm or, going to the DC store. Well, I, I, I'm actually one block over, so I'm on AC. So I've got to go buy an AC adapter for all my DC products now. And new markers are getting generated. Well, right. Well, because right here, because you're also going to have companies that come up with new technology, and they're only going to put their research into, okay, how do we make this thing run on AC, or how do we make this thing run on DC? Right. Um, and so then you have to decide, well, I still really want this thing, so I guess I'm going to have to get an adapter, and adapters are inefficient. Yeah. But the thing is, and and, and no, you're wrong, in a perfect system eventually you would reach a steady state where most people would just come to one side or the other for the sake of their own efficiency. Like it's like, okay, fine. I'm tired of having to buy adapters. I'm either moving to a new area because I can freely do that, or I'm going to pay the the DC power station, the block over to run a line to my house instead. Cause I can afford that. And they're just looking for customers because there's competition strong enough. Eventually one will win out over the other not necessarily based on which is more efficient, but which is more convenient. And and that's what you see, like, for example, even in a free society, I argue Microsoft would still exist for now because of their, how they're large and it would, and the amount of energy it would take to move to a new system would be expensive and time consuming. And so people don't want to do that. Uh, people want the path of least resistance. A lot of people do. Now, granted, you can. I'm not wanting to get into the weeds on that necessarily right now. That could be a different episode because that's a whole other thing. But because of that, we will go with whatever is just easiest and does the job, right? Instead of maybe looking at what can get us to the next level or what could be potentially better. Um, and I'm not saying that this is... And I will say this is a reason that people do argue for centralized authorities because... Some things, when they're decided on in a centralized authority, can be more efficient, even if they lose that efficiency in bureaucracy, you know. Yeah, well, like, um, well, this is the reason why IEEE exists, or ANSI, you know, whatever. Any standards bureau, really. Um, You know, or back in the the early days of, uh, of optical storage media, you know, basically all the tech companies got together or all, all the computer companies got together and said hey engineers working on optical storage standards uh you better get your story straight or else we're not going to make components for your for your technology for our computers right or another good example uh i watched a documentary on was a, a sgml to html and xml for those of you who don't know those are markup language standards before the internet there was a way to tag documents for Essentially, I don't just want to search this document for all, uh, like, for example, the, the Department of Defense was one of the biggest uh, backers of what's called standard uh, SGL. I think it's standard general markup language or sure. standardized general markup language, something like that. What because what before. they wanted to do is to be able to use a computer to quickly say, hey, just get me all expenses from this large 5,000 page report. And what it would do is run through and anything you tag as an expense will get pulled out and then dropped into a list. And it makes it so much easier to sort and deal with data in just seas of text, right? Well, when the internet came about, people said, hey, we have this SGML thing over here. Why don't we just make a hypertext markup language, is what HTML stands for, to design websites, which is essentially a bunch of tags that get interpreted into the things you are seeing all around the screen right now. And so, the, but the problem was there were differing standards between SGML and HTML. Not only were there different standards, but there were different philosophies. And there was a huge conference that was willingly put together from people who said, we cannot have a difference. And ultimately, the people who would write the parsers for web browsers, for example, and at this time it was actually Sun Microsystems and uh, Netscape were the two big ones. Yeah. Um, they hosted this conference because they didn't want you to be, have to switch browsers to access different websites. And the people making the browsers didn't want to have to pay royalties to use these third-party parsers. And so each time you create a new website, if your website became popular enough on another browser and they wanted to support it, they would have to license out your parser for your crap. You know, It was inefficient for everybody. So they put together this big discussion over 
what are the rules? And it was all no uh, government was involved. And that's a, that's really good. But experts were involved. You don't the average person wasn't called in like anyone could go to this thing. But the people on the panel were people who were the experts in designing PDF because PDF uses a markup language itself to essentially tag up documents. The guy who created HTML, life, his name escapes me right now. Uh, one of the guy, and then one guy from Sun Microsystems, who was one of the lead developers for br- their browser. I can't even remember what it is. And then the Netscape browser uh, was there. And so, because these people were the experts, they got to have a lot more of a say over which one we ended up using and what the standard eventually became than your average person. And ultimately we ended up with what we have now, which some people will still say is inefficient, but it doesn't matter what these people say. There isn't a browser out there that will support your SGML website. Sorry, tough, you know, and because of convenience, we've moved to this. And so it's in this way that I think the role of the expert will maintain its importance in a free society, but the way by which we come to deciding who an expert is, is more important because now... It really is up to the people in the area of the field who are making these decisions to determine who these experts are, not just someone who gets elected by majority popularity, you know. So I think it could be a good thing in the way that it becomes a lot more localized or decentralized. I think that could be much more beneficial there. Um, And as a quick tangent, that's why you you won't get things like today where Noam Chomsky gets called in every time politics happens and he's asked for his opinion because he's an expert on linguistics. You know, it's like, why is he up there talking to me about political science? Because he's an expert in what? Linguistics and human development. It's like, well, why does that matter? You know, like you see experts get called in all the time and feels they have no great understanding in but just because their name is recognizable uh, i think we will see a lot less of that but i do think that people will come to rely on them uh, on experts more because in in the vacuum of authority that exists there will still be that human tendency to look for an authority outside themselves for things that they don't have time to deal with and that authority is going to be sunk into the experts as well and so I don't think a free society can necessarily be achieved without experts or without the concept of the expert being core to the common belief set. But it's also something that I think could be a potential danger zone as well, because these experts could easily become the next tyrants and the nexus of authority just because they're experts. And then instead of getting a free society, we enter into a air quotes, meritocratic society where the there is uh, multiple classes all on the strata of their expertise regardless of you know anything else. So anyway, now that was just an interesting little thought experiment I wanted to go through because it was interesting to me uh, how that would work in that society because I really didn't know. It was interesting to think about. So for sure. All right. Well, I think we are hitting our time here. So David, do you have anything else to add? Uh, be be skeptical. Be skeptical. Next time on Philosophers, <laughs> how to be skeptical. Uh, wait a minute. Have we already done an episode on that? No. I think that might actually be a good episode. A good and proper skeptic, we shall call it. <laughs> um, how, I learned to, how I learned to be more skeptical of the bomb. <laughs> Just, oh, man. But yeah, that's all for next time. So in lieu of anything else to say, philosophers. Philosophers.